Let's bow our hearts to the Lord. Yes, indeed, Heavenly Father, we know your kingdom has no end. And we thank you, Lord, that you have made us part of that kingdom because of what you have done for us. Even though we were sinners far away from you, you sent your son Jesus to die upon the cross. And he came to this world and he saved our souls. And we thank you, Lord, that one day we will be there in your kingdom. As your word says, even though we don't know how it's going to fully look like, we trust in you and believe in you. We pray, Lord, that you give us the uh, wisdom to understand you more and more. Heavenly Father, we bring you before you this evening your word. We pray that you bless it in our hearts. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be able to be here, to minister to each one of us, Lord, to fill what we need in our hearts this evening. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, I'd, uh, if we can open up our Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. And uh, always around. About this time of the year, I seem to always come back to, to this, to Noah and the flood and the, the basics of um, what God has done and the lessons we can learn from God's word um, and to understand what God says to us when we look at the flood of Noah. So Genesis chapter 8, the flood had come and now it's uh, got to the stage where God is going to still work. So Genesis chapter 8. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were in the ark and God made a wind to pass over the earth. And the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped. And the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the waters decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month and the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days, and Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Then he sent out a raven, which had kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent from, from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her, and drew her into the ark himself. And he waited another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days, and sent out a dove, which did not return to him again any more. Now it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month of the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah remembered the covering, the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. In the second month of the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. The God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle of every creeping thing that creeps in the earth, that they may abound on earth and may be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird and every whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered bird offerings in the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Up to there. One thing about the Old Testament and the Noah and the flood, when you look at the New Testament, categorically, you have to say that it is a fact because Jesus mentions it a couple of times, Noah and the flood, 
Peter mentions it in 2 Peter. Paul mentions it in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11. So the New Testament, when you look at the people who wrote the New Testament, God inspired to write, you can see quite categorically to them the flood was real. No shadow of a doubt. And it stands there as a witness to them and to us as from a biblical point of view, uh, theology and biblical fact, that it happened. Then you come to looking around the scientific facts around us and you see, when you look through the biblical eyes, when you see, for example, what it meant that things were buried layer under layer, and more and more, as the world, as the world believes less and more sceptical, there's actually more evidence being dug up more and more to show that something dramatic happened. You know, an article does not come past when I read them and says, for example, they say, oh, the, the, the earth was at one stage uh, covered fully with a lot of vegetation and suddenly there was destruction and things were died quite suddenly. And to the person who has been born again, who believes the scripture, we can see it straight away. We can see that that is the flood of Noah. That's what they're talking about, that they cannot see it because they don't have faith in God. And so the theories change all the time. You can read about them and they even last week, you know, oh, well, some of the assumptions we made at the start, some of the scientists came out and said, oh, we made some assumptions. Well, we don't know whether they're right or not. I mean, how can you, how can you answer, for example, that there's uh, seashells on Mount Everest? How can you answer that without a biblical view? It says here in one of the passages that, that the first day of the month, this is verse 5, the tops of the mountains were seen. So you can, what we look at God's word and say, you know what? The earth covered the whole, sorry, the flood covered the whole earth, even the tops of the mountains. You know, Mount Everest and all those places, it was covered. Now, how it all happened, you know, God reveals it in his word, uh, and you go to originally and you see, for example, how the earth was before Noah's flood. And uh, the Bible talks about the fact that there was a mist going over the whole earth. And uh, that created a huge amount of vegetation that could support the dinosaurs and all those animals that they're finding quite readily. I tell you, a day does not pass where they've dug up something. And they, they're wondering, how did this get here? And they make assumptions and so forth. But here we have God's word. And it says to us, this is what happened. Because man's heart was evil. The imagination of man's heart continued to be evil. And God judged the world. And today it stands. It stands as a, a way of judgment. Whether you can also look at the passages referring to Sodom and Gomorrah. And you can see, once again, you know, Jesus talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Paul talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, even Peter talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. So they use them in the same uh, vein, the same category, that they are real. And when you look around and you look at by, through biblical eyes, yes, they come to life. And then it makes you wonder how powerful God is and what it meant for the whole world. And it, it really blows your mind to understand that you know, this wasn't a local flood, this wasn't something small, this was the whole world. And when we believe in the scriptures, and we believe, for example, that God created the heavens and the earth, and the world that we live in, it's pretty easy after that. When we believe that Jesus rose from the dead and is alive today, everything else is pretty easy after that. Because uh, to believe the big ticket items uh, makes it easy then to believe what happens here. The Bible says that God, in this particular verse, that the earth, flood had come, the earth was, was full of water, and now the Bible says that God remembered Noah. Not that he forgot Noah, but now God was going to act for and tell Noah what he was going to do. So it says here that he made a wind, which is quite interesting, made a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. And the fountains of the deep 
and the, the rain, the, the, the windows of heaven closed. Remember that? That's how everything started. The fountains of the deep started. The windows of heaven opened up. And now he closed them. And now things have stopped. And the water started receding. It started receding. And it says, and it's quite, uh, when we look at uh, being, um, looking at a contract of some sort, a contract is quite detailed with regards to dates and time frames and so forth. And in the same way, this chapter and previous chapters of this, there's dates, there's times. Make no, it doesn't allow us for any uh, a deviation. This is what it took, 140 days and 40 nights it rained. Solid, that's in the word of God, it's like a contract. 150 days it took for the water to recede, that's in here. And it gives months and days, and you can look at, uh, if you want to look at history, you can see that the number of weeks and the number of days, and it is categorical, it is quite specific about what had happened, what had happened. So Noah... His, the waters have receded, the, the rains have stopped, the water's receding, and Noah does what he does, and he takes out a raven, a raven, a blackbird, and he sends it out. He sends it out. And when we look at the scripture, we can see, for example, that a raven is an unclean, animal, an unclean bird. And when the raven went out, it didn't come back. And normally what happens with a raven, it finds its scavenger. It eats dead meat. So what might have happened, you know, if we look at this part of it, it went out and it found some dead thing and it started eating. It said, I'm not coming back. And when we look at the New Testament, we can see how the ravens and the birds are treated. The, the raven is treated as an unclean animal. Unclean animal. Whereas they weren't offered as a sacrifice later on. But the dove, he sends it the dove. The dove couldn't find a place where to set its foot. So it comes back. And then it comes back again with, with an olive branch. And, you know, today the whole world, the whole world looks at the olive branch. You know, if you think of the, uh, the Olympic Games and, you know, the olive branch and, and the um, message of the, the olive branch, meaning peace and, and so forth, uh, is displayed for the whole world to see. He comes back, the dove comes back, she comes back and she has an olive a branch signifying that growth is happening. And then he sends her out again, she doesn't come back. There's, there's land. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Uh, God said it. Now he is using uh, what he has available to him to basically uh, know and give his own timing with regards to what's happening out there. What's happening out there? Now, when we read about what is going on, it says, then Noah, in verse 15, verse 15 says, then God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your family and your wives. Remember when God was started the, and told Noah that there was going to flood, a flood going to come on the earth? He says, come into the ark. Come into the ark. God was in the ark. And now he says, go out. Go out out of the ark, you and your family, take the animals with you, multiply and uh, do what has to be done because I'm giving it all to you. There's going to be plenty of food, plenty of growth and just go out there. You know, you can do a message on this with regards to how now God is saying to all of us, go out into the world, go out, you, your wives, your family, go out into the world and multiply the gospel. Multiply that so other people can hear. Now that you've been saved, now that you've been, you're, you're transformed, you know what God can do. He has saved your life and my life. He in saved us in Jesus Christ because when you look at the ark, you know, we've often done this, we look at the Old Testament and say, where is Jesus in the Old Testament? He's on every page. And when we look at the ark, we see an image of Christ. An image of Christ. Those who trust are saved. There's a door of the ark on the side. And they enter by the side. When Jesus was upon the cross and he died, the spear was taken, the soldier took the spear and thrust it into his side. And out of that side come blood, blood and water mixed, signifying that the blood now has saved us. 
It's the blood that saves us, the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us. So we have this image here, quite an astounding image, of Jesus Christ saving us. We come to him. We come into his heart and we come into his possession. We become his possession. He's bought us with a price, the, you know, the price of Jesus Christ, the blood, the, uh, the amazing price that he, he spilt for us. And we come to him. Now we're saved. And now what does he say? Go out. Go out into the whole world. Go out, multiply what you have. All the things that you have with regards to God's things, that is the, the things that, uh, of the gospel, go out multiply and you see them Noah and his family now in a physical sense going out going out and they are now multiplying and he takes of every animal go out they went out and then what what does Noah do he builds an altar to God builds an altar to God and he took of every clean animal every clean bird and offered bird offerings on the altar so the, after he was told to go out, he lived the life of sacrifice. And when you think about it, he provides, God asks for, and he asked for here, and Noah obeyed the commandment, and he offered them upon the altar. And you think to yourself, well, you know what? Didn't know when was he risking something here? Because, uh, you know, these animals have just come off. And now he's willing to offer them as a living sacrifice. And after this day, obviously, the, the number of them would, would sort of dissipate. Was there a risk that somehow, well, I'm offering them to you, but, but what's going to happen if you don't multiply them? If we go back to this part of the Bible that says, you know, God says, take two of every animal, okay? Take two of every animal. But then, he says, God says, of the clean animals, take seven. Take seven, seven of them. Seven of the clean animals and the clean birds. So when you think this through, when in God's eyes, he was speaking to Noah and giving him instructions, detailed instructions. Of these two, of these animals, you know, the unclean, take two Two of each, male and female, you should take them. But of the clean, take seven. And Noah obeyed and embedded in that those instructions were the, was the fact that the sacrifice was provided. You see what's happened here? God tells Noah to take seven of the clean animals and the clean birds. And God provides the sacrifice. He provides for them. It's something that God continually does and it is magnified and quite obvious that Jesus Christ is the sacrifice that God provides. So, in Noah's time, he had seven animals of each Seven birds of each. He had room there, six of them, six groups, to provide a sacrifice. God provided, provided the sacrifice. And all he had to do was obey. He only had to do was obey. And he took, the Bible says he took of, of them, he took of them, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. He smelt a soothing aroma that Noah was willing to sacrifice what he had, even though God provided that. And we see that this is what happens through the Old Testament and the New Testament. God provides the sacrifice. Where is the lamb? Abraham and Isaac. Where is the sacrifice? And God, uh, Abraham says, don't worry, God will provide. He provided. And in the case of Abraham and Isaac, we saw uh, uh, basically a goat, a male goat with his um, horn stuck in the thicket. And God used that because God provided. 
how much more would God provide the ultimate sacrifice as we just have revealed that Jesus Christ, God sent his son. Remember those, that verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That, that understanding of God that, you know what? I'm going to provide it all. And all you've got to do is believe. And Noah, he also believed. He believed our God and he obeyed God and what he did was he took of the clean birds and the clean animals and he provided a sacrifice. And that was a soothing aroma. Not that it was really the methodology in his heart. That is, you know what? If God says, I'm going to sacrifice these animals, I'll do it. Even though God has provided them. It's, you know, this is you know, quite amazing that God provides everything and all we've got to do is uh, reflect our love in our uh, What's in our heart, in our actions. That is, what was in Noah's heart was that he was going to obey God. And he provided and he did what God told him. And that was for God a soothing, as it says here, a soothing aroma. Aroma to God that Noah had obeyed him. As soon as he had landed, again, there was faith. There was faith. The sacrifice now or it was done and there was faith. And what does God do? God says, you know what? He says, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although, this is a key verse, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again, again destroy every living thing as I have done. So there's a realisation that the flood of Noah, flood of Noah, even though it shows a judgment upon man, even though it shows a warning upon man, like the law, the law is uh, a lot like that, that is, it's a taskmaster, it says who we are, and even though that man's heart was still evil, and we can all attest to that, even today, we can make that uh, assumption, make that conclusion that man's heart is still evil because water does not wash away the sin and change. Only the blood of Christ, Jesus Christ, is able to do that. The Bible says to us in 1 John, though you sin, though and I sin, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us from all sin. And that well, there can be a change. There can be a change. Even though the Bible here says that man's heart is continually evil. And we'll see how that, through the Old Testament, how that really happens. The, the murder that happens, the wars that happen, the, the, the massacres that happen, the things that man does, we see and read about them continually in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. Except Jesus comes back to redeem, to change, to change people. And it says here... I will, I will, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So, as we read in the New Testament, that God brought a flood, He's never going to do it again. Never going to do it again. We often have that joke, you know, what, uh, oh, look how much rain there is, you know, let's start building a Noah's Ark because we're going to get flooded out and so forth. And we see they're all basically localized, localized floods, nothing of the sort and the magnitude that we see here worldwide you know i cannot stress as we look upon this world put on our biblical glasses and you'll see you'll see what the water has done you know the the stratas and so forth as you look at them and you know there's there's for example uh in the strata how can you have curved uh strata like that you know they often said you know it curved up slowly and so forth maybe you know what it was the water pressure that made them curve and if they try to move them they're like concrete they're like concrete. and there, there are millions of those sort of um, images and structures all over the world attesting to attesting to the flood of noah as a believer uh, we believe by faith we are saved by faith and we continually do that. But it's pretty easy when it comes to the flood of Noah to have a look and to see, yep, there it is. 
before our eyes. This is what's happened. What do we see? Millions and millions of dead things buried layer upon layer. Whether it's a, the white cliffs of Dover, whether it's, um, uh, for example, the, uh, the mines and so forth, the things they find, the coal mines. My, my cousin in Greece worked, when I was there last time, he worked for one of the uh, coal mines, the electricity companies. And he was saying to me, and I said to him, do you find many things buried under there? He said, oh, we find things every time, but you can hear the machine, clack, 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 clack. It destroys everything, whether it's uh, something of significance, whether it's uh, some buried uh, wood from that period of time. They find things, but we, don't, we can't tell anybody. Because if we say we found something archaeologically significant, they'll shut us down, and nobody wants to be shut down. We don't want the government here telling us, well, let's stop here. There's something that we've, we've found that people will lose their jobs and nobody was willing to risk any of that. So they just let them go through the machine. Clunk, 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 clunk. Things being chewed up all the time. Things of significance. Things that you, you find uh, basically buried layer upon layer. How many dinosaur bones they found? Who knows? But they will never be seen. Never be seen because you don't stop a, a something like that to be able to... Uh, show the flood of Noah. No, no, we want, we want sure that, our, that we get our wages, we want to feed our families and so forth and so on. None of that to happen. And this is all over the world. How many times have you heard the inland Australia? Once it was covered by a massive amount of water and it was a dense forest. And they find all sorts of animals in there and bones all over the world. You know what, as a Christian and having uh, the flood of Noah and uh, having this part of the Bible, you know what, we're such an advantage knowing and seeing that, you know what, this is the way it happened. And then you bow down in honour to God and you understand this. we have a powerful God. His word is true. His word is true. And God says this, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. While the earth remains. Embedded in this verse is a statement, is a fact, that one day the earth as we know it will cease. The Bible says that the day of the Lord shall come. And we look at Revelations, we look and we see that uh, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And it verifies here the day of judgment. Embedded in this uh, verse is the fact that while the earth remains, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And God outlines here some promises. You know, we have a God of promises. He gives promises in his word all over. He says, if you obey me, I'll bless you. I'll be with you. If you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved and you will go to heaven. God's promises are all over in, in the Bible. And here are more promises. And these promises, he says, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. And every day, every week, every month, every year, we live out these promises. This is what happens. This is what happens. And, you know, we, we've taken things for granted that... You know what, today we're you know, in the southern hemisphere and it's summertime and it's hot. It's supposed to be hot. But winter's going to come. Autumn's going to come first. Then winter. Then spring. We take it for granted. We think, you know what, that's the way things are, nature is. But this is what God says. This is what God says. This is what happened. The earth, before that time, before Noah's flood was different. You know, we, we have inklings of what it's like, 
a mist going all over the earth, uh, uh, basically uh, filling and um, uh, watering all the plant life. And it was a constant, it looks like it was a constant mist. That's what we sort of have come to. But here we have a change. That there were going to be seasons. And these seasons we take for granted. A farmer today decides, I'm going to plant seeds today. And it's bare. It may be cold. It may be uh, a lot of rain and there's no growth. And by having faith in the promises of God, he puts the seed in. And lo and behold, a couple of months later, bloop, out it comes. And not only that, it grows. And then there's heat and there's more rain and the, the farmer and all of us then enjoy the fruit, the vegetable, and the food that we have. But it's a, it's a fact that it was done and the, the faith was performed earlier on. There was faith in the promises of God. You know, we have taken these and the world has taken these somehow as you know, a given. But it's God saying this, that all nature has changed. And all nature is subject to his word. All nature is subject to his word. As long as the earth remains, there'll be summer and winter, night and day, all coming through and we trust and we follow this. You know, some of us, you know, when we think about our holidays, we think, you know, we're going to go to Greece or overseas. Let's go in uh, June, July, August, because the weather's going to be really good. And lo and behold, it is better than the cold of winter. But we plan. We plan for those things. And we plan it, unbeknown to us, that it's based on these verses. God's promise is that there'll be summer and winter, night and day, cold and heat. They shall not cease as long as the earth remains. Now, we live in an age where people are questioning all these. You know, how often have you heard, oh, well, you know, things are changing, you know, coming through, the weather's uh, all over the shop. You know, a couple of months ago, a couple of months ago, they said... Um, the weather bureau are going to come out and they're going to say it's an El Nino event, event. That is, it's not going to rain this summer and it's going to be really hot. And they were just about to flick the switch and tell everybody the case. And lo and behold, it's not that, that's not the case. But there is that deviation, the, the fact that we're into summer, that the things are still growing, that God's word is true. Even though we might say that these are going to cease, the world says sometimes that these are going to cease, that it's going to be absolute chaos. You know what? One day it will be absolute chaos. But that's when the earth ceases. That's when the earth ceases. These promises embedded in this chapter, as I've said, we take for granted. Then when you believe these promises, then you go through the, all, all the Bible and there's other promises and uh, as a result of believing them, you then understand how God works. The Bible says the following, whatever a man soweth, that he shall reap. So if a farmer sows carrots, well, you lo and behold, at the end of the time he's going to get carrots. If we sow in sin, lo and behold, we will reap sin. And those who have lived in the world know how, how painful it can be and how sin can destroy and how it's really hard to get out of that cycle of sin. You know, and God is able to change and transform people. And that's, that's a promise. 
I'll be with you until the end of age. God's promises are true. So when we look out and we see summer's coming, now you look at the leaves sometimes, in a couple of months you'll see the leaves and they'll be changing colour, and you'll be thinking, well, autumn's on its way. Knowing this, that, that's part of God's promises. That the seasons will change. Night and day happen. Night and day happen. Don't they? You're waiting for, for the night. And then uh, during the night, you're waiting for the sun to rise and to have the morning day and coming through. A promise of God. And the whole world sees these promises, don't they? Don't the whole world see these promises? And what it shows is God's ultimate power and how he's pushed to the side. He's pushed to the side. Even though he said it, people have forgotten. Many have forgotten. They take it for granted. We take it for granted sometimes that, yes, the seasons will change. God is in control. You know, it's a bit of a... Uh, an understanding further of what God has done. And can we open up the Bibles to Psalm 147? Gives me a chance to drink a bit of water too. <clears throat> God has made those promises. And now we see in Psalm 147 a further example of what God has done and is doing. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. It is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our God and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble he casts the wicked down to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with the clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes the grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens that cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your children within you. He makes peace in your borders and fills you with the finest wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. It's, his word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts out hail like morsel. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgment to Israel. He, is, he has not dealt thus with any nation, for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. I chose this particular psalm but because it's an extension of those verses that refer to day and night, seasons, the cold, the winter and, and summer. Is this an extension that God is ruling today and his promises are true his promises are true you know and we read in ecclesiastics that there's a time there's a time of seasons for us too and the earth is going about its seasons and there's a season for us also and the bible talks about this a time to be born a time to die a time to plant, a time to pluck up or expand it, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to laugh, a time to mourn. How true is that in, the, in, our, in our lives? A time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a, t a time to gain and a time to lose, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war 
and a time of peace. While the world has its functionality and its mechanisms, so have we. So have we in the whole scheme of things. And we, we change too, and God has ordained them, ordained these events. And the, the spiritual events are intertwined within that. But ultimately this, if you can take anything from this chapter, this chapter 8 is this. That God made promises, Noah believed his promises, and was blessed. And God, embedded in chapter 8, are still more promises. We can look back at his uh, statement that he's going to bring a flood to the earth. And we can hear the words of Jesus. We can hear the words of Paul and Peter expressed by the Holy Spirit speaking to them and written down. And we hear that and we know that that happened. And then we look at his promises that are for us today. And these are the summer and winter promises there for us too. But there are bigger promises too. That, you know, Jesus says that, I'll go prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. You know, do not fret. Do not be, do not lose heart. God cares for us because we have come to Christ. Those of us here, what can see. And we, we have trusted him. We have gone into the ark. We have been saved. And now we're out of the ark, so to speak. We're, we're still in his grace, under his um, auspices, and we're going out. We're going out, and we're living this life when we multiply the word of God and we grow because we still believe his promises. Next time you look at the weather, and next time you see uh, spring coming to a fall, the leaf coming out, one of the first trees that buds and it buds in winter, late winter, is the almond tree. While it's cold, and it's the normally the end of winter is the coldest, you know, August. While it's cold, it buds. The flowers come out. Nature believes God's promises. You know, and the Bible says that even if the almond tree does not bud, I will put my trust in you. But lo and behold, the almond tree does bud in winter, signifying this. When you see that almond tree, you'll say, spring is on its way. But more importantly, you say, God is keeping his promise until the earth ceases. My God bless his wonderful word in our hearts tonight. Amen. Let's all stand. We'll say, say a prayer and then we'll sing, sing a song. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. In your word is truth. And we thank you, Lord, that tonight, like every time we get together, we can take of your truth and be inspired to understand you better. And we thank you, Lord, that as we take of your truth, we can see how magnificent you are. And we thank you, Lord, that you have saved us. You've opened up our ears, spiritual ears, opened up our eyes, that we can see your glory. Heavenly Father, let's be like Noah. That is, in due time, when required, be able to sacrifice to you, knowing that you have provided it all. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us this evening, and we pray that you bless us, bless us tomorrow with your word and guide us. In Jesus' name. Amen.